here some quantum gravity theory and this should be dual to some CFT which I will call holographic CFT and I'll try to define that leaves if you want at the boundary here of the idea. So in fact I prefer to think of this more not as a, as a duality, but more as a rule for UV completion, okay? So I will have here some effective field theory, some gravitational effective field theory. Yes. And I'll think that if I want to define really a full UV complete theory, that will be a, a CFT. And a, a CFT with specific properties. So this is the clay, this is the idea that there's no non-perturbative bulk description of the, the theory. That's the, that's your right. So so the examples we know examples which work more like this because we in principle have a definition of quantum gravity to all energies if we use string theory, at least order by order in G string. But uh, here I for most of the discussion I want to take this more general perspective that uh, okay. perhaps we can find UV completions of theories, effective field theories in ADS, which we don't know the string theory origin. Right. Oh, sorry, I, I was wondering whether you were saying that even in principle the bulk description is only some order by, uh, some... Uh... That's okay, if you want, that's the first open question. I don't know, I think in string theory we have some evidence. I mean, Nathan was telling us yesterday about uh, you can compute in principle order by order in a, in a string expansion and then maybe Marcus can help us resum that and <laughs> in principle maybe there is an independent definition but yeah that's okay, right. okay. and um, and now there is just some basic properties if you think in these terms which is so the effective field theory is only useful if you have some weak coupling which in the gravitational theory basically means that the radius of ADS must be much bigger than the Planck length. Okay, so, you, so here I will, then I will make some more general comments, but for the moment here I will assume that that's basically an overall coupling that controls all interactions in ADS, and that would be the gravitational coupling. And so if you have gravitons in ADS, gravity is always weakly coupled at low energies, but of course you have to go to low energies compared to the Planck length and you have this IR cutoff R, so that's, that's your condition. And so once you have weak coupling, you have a notion of uh, single particle states and multiparticle states. And, um, and so you have a notion of Fox space in the spectrum. And, uh, and that translates on the CFT to a structure on the spectrum of operators of single trace and, and uh, multi-trace, and that's what we usually call large N factorization. Okay. So, um, okay, so and, uh, if you want to do the match, N square will go like uh, this R, this, this small parameter. I mean, this you get because uh, this is just the 1 over g newton, the dimensional as combination in terms of g newton. Okay? So this I will call property number one. And then, if you really want to have a proper effective field theory, it's not just it's weakly coupled, it's also we have some few fields, right? There's only a few fields that you write in the effective field theory, so few light fields.
So in particular, you define some UV cutoff, which you can think of it as uh, some heavy particles that you're integrating out. So you have some heavy scale compared with the ADS radius. And below that heavy scale, you have a few fields. Okay? So that would mean that you have just a few single trace operators with scaling dimension of order one. And this condition is often stated as a condition of the gap. And um, it's convenient to think of this heavy state to make this actually precise, to call it the minimum dimension of operators with spin greater than 2. Okay? And so this delta gap has to be greater. And this is what we usually call condition number 2. Okay. So the condition on the spin is quite useful because, as we shall see, sometimes these few are actually infinite number of states that come from the loser client modes, but they all have spin at most 2. So the, it's very convenient to define delta gap as the highest spin. Uh, so few means some exponential growth? Again, at the moment, I'm... Uh, and depends what is your question. So, so we, at this level, if you really want just an effective field in ADS D plus 1, it would be like finite number. That would be the strongest form. I will briefly discuss, if you go, say, to ADS 3, CFT 2, where we have much more control, then uh, there is a condition that is sub-exponential, which already implies, say, the universality of black holes. Um, so if you want That's another <coughs> open question, is to know exactly how to make the condition very precise so that all the other gravitational properties follow. So this is, for the moment, our best guess in the simplest scenario where there is one coupling that controls all interactions and... and I, I was wondering whether n equals 4 weak coupling meets your condition. No, it was the second condition. Right. Yes, right. Plenty of operators in of dimension of order 1. Yeah. So the, that's a very important point. This, this first condition is very easy to achieve. You just write any large N gauge theory, it will obey it. This is the hard one. This implies strong coupling. It's much greater than one mean that it grows in a specific way with the first parameter no, that's much greater it, than one? It, I mean, it cannot be... Uh, it cannot go into this uh, Planck length regime, right? So this M heavy has to be smaller than the Planck scale. That you will, because otherwise, at this level, you don't even know what's a single particle and a multiparticle. Everything is strongly interacting. But, uh, but it could be a fixed ratio, right? In string theory, you can have a fixed ratio between Planck and string scale. I guess I meant that the delta gap. Is that one supposed to go with yeah, like some power of n? But it's the same, right? You see, n is related to the Planck scale, and delta gap is related to the... Um, so this is delta gap. And in string theory, mh is just one over L string, right? Mm. So... Okay, so this is the, the setup, and, uh, and the first question, the first question I want to ask, I think it's the one that keeps me awake at night, is are there, are there CFTs uh, satisfying One plus two. Right. So this is this is the danger. I actually had a friend, a mathematician friend, that he was doing his PhD and he defined some set with lots of properties, and then after two years he found out it was the empty set, nothing was there. <laughs> so I don't want to spend my life <laughs> in that situation. So okay, of course you think, but I mean, of course we know some. So the answer is yes, but it's not. You already have to be a bit more flexible, so as I already mentioned, but you have infinite number of these light fields, okay? So you have infinite number of uh, KK modes, because all the examples we know come from uh, uh, ADS 
time some internal space, right? Yes. Okay, I can I ask you about the left blackboard? So sure. Um, here, in the, on the right side, on the CFT side, uh, having gravity or not having gravity sounds really innocuous, right? You just say you have stress tensor or not. So yes. It sounds like a very minor thing. On the other hand, in the bulk, for if we have ADS QFT, we have sharp light cone, we have operator algebras, we can discuss all these QFT things, and when we turn on gravity, all this is gone. So, where is this somehow in the CFT? So, right, so you're asking how, how to reconstruct bulk locality even when you have quantum field theory, when there is no gravity, right? So this is, you can even ask uh, the same question in, I mean, in boundary quantum field theory, boundary conformal field theory, right? You give you bound, all the boundary correlators, how can you recover the bulk? Not even just how, but if we try, we will be able to construct things yeah. which are sharply commuting, etc. Whereas, including stress tensor should preclude this from happening. But from the CFT side, we don't really understand, right? No. Just from the bootstrap equation, as you said, it looks like just one more operator, the stress tensor. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Any any other question? Sorry about, about your question one. If if we assume that the fastest possible growth is kaluza klein growth, mm -hmm. then that would suggest that if we have an ADS and we assume that. 11 is the highest dimension we can go to. Then that would give that, that would suggest a bound for the growth of, of your life. <coughs> yeah. Perhaps one could prove that using something. Is that a something one could try to shoot? Using bootstrap or something. So if we were D dimensions, D space-time dimensions, so we would have a, a gas in 11 minus, you know what I mean. You want to find 11 from bootstrap? Is that the claim? Well, I mean, you, you can actually, if you do a one loop computation. Without supersymmetry, you claim to oh, find 11? No, not without supersymmetry. Well, with supersymmetry, there's no, there's no point. That's 11 just by supersymmetry. <laughs> no, but if you just start from the field theory, you, you don't know that you're, mm -hmm. you're landing on, a, on some bulk thing. I was wondering whether the field theory could <clears throat> sense this. Yeah, I mean, uh, you will see that the main theme of most of uh, my discussion will be that uh, so far the bootstrap doesn't do better than effective field theory. And the best it can do is, okay, make causality more precise and derive rigorous bounds. But like, for example, why don't we have a theory of quantum gravity in I don't know, 54 dimensions? I mean, we can write an effective field theory, and so, so I, I would be very pessimistic, but uh, okay. try that. Okay, so let me start with the extreme example. Okay. Let me start with pure gravity. Suppose you want to ask this question for pure gravity in ADS4. Okay, so we live in four dimensions. Can we UV complete pure gravity in ADS4? And okay, you follow this reasoning, then there's just T mu nu plus heavy operator, and uh, clearly there's not going to be any weakly coupled theory you can write CFT in three dimensions, right? There's a CFT that has uh, only the stress tensor as the light operator, and then, okay, it's multi trace, it's composite, and then it can have heavy stuff. Do such CFTs exist? Well, they must be strongly coupled, so the only possible way to attack this problem would be to use the bootstrap. Okay. So, in some sense, people try it. So, you can bootstrap the four-point function of the stress tensor and try to see if, from this four-point function, you get some evidence for the existence or non-existence of such theories, such UV completions of pure gravity. Okay. So this was done already almost five years ago by Dimarski, Kos, Krabschuk, Poland, and Simon Tuffin. They, they did study the CFT bootstrap for this four-point function with parity. Okay, so they assume parity symmetry for simplicity. That's okay. And let me just briefly tell you one or two main results from this bootstrap study, okay, so that we get a picture of what are the difficulties 
if you want to use Bootstrap to address my first question. Sorry, parity or not parity is the operators you allow in the CFT. So the, the, the CFT3 assume uh, preserves parity and T is a parity even operator and then that will give some selection rules for the operators that can be exchanged here. So, uh, so just to set up some notation, so TT two-point function of course is fixed by conformal symmetry up to a constant, that's what we call CT and let me call this structure what you get in the theory of one free boson. And the three-point function is fixed up to two constants, so it's convenient to write it like TTT boson, again, what you get in the theory of free, free boson, and NF times what you get in the theory of a free fermion. Okay, if you break parity, there's one more structure. That, that's where parity enters, for example. And then there's some word identity that relates these two, so there's actually only two independent parameters, and so I will use CT and an angle theta to do the, to show the plot, which is given by this ratio of, uh, of these two parameters. Okay, so CT and theta, maybe I'll plot it here. Yes, I can plot as a function of theta. You can see these plots in, in their paper. So all CFTs must live in this plane, all three of these CFTs. And, uh, and there's two special points that I can already mark. So if you go here at one, so this is the free boson theory. CFT, and this is the free fermion CFT. Sorry, I'm lost. Um, so, what, where do fermions come from? What are, it's just some. No, so this is generic, <laughs> but by conformal symmetry, the two point function is completely fixed. So, I just normalized it by the one of bosons. And what do you mean bosons? You mean you free bo know? one free boson in three dimensions. And then you compute the, the stress tensor two point function in that theory. What, 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 what tells you what the CFT has free bosons? Is my it doesn't. This is just any two-point function of stress tensors in a, two, in a 3D CFT is proportional. It's, it's fixed up to a number. That I agree, yeah. And so I'm, okay, this one is a specific theory and any theory is the same up to a number. That's yes. what I'm saying. Okay. And the third and the next one with NB and NF, what is that? The next one is similar. So the three-point function is fixed up to two numbers. There's two independent structures and I can choose the two independent tensor structures to be the theory of a free boson and what you get in a free boson theory and what you get in a free fermion theory. It's just a parameterization of the three-point function. Compared in particular, NB and NF will not be integers in general, right? NB and NF will not be integers. They are just generic numbers. Why did you choose a free boson? Why couldn't you just use two free bosons? Why did you? I just don't understand why you're choosing a free boson and a free fermion. What, what, what? Well, you need to have two independent tensor structures if you just use Two free bosons, you get twice times this. So you need to have two theories that give you two independent tensor structures for the three-point function of the... But I mean... It's just a basis, right? You could have chosen any other basis. Yeah, you can choose any other basis. B and NF have to be non-negative. Okay, so a priori, you don't know. Then... There is an argument, so if you do the conformal collider bounds of hoffman maldacena you do get that, uh, uh, so the conformal collider bounds do lead to NB positive and NF positive, or greater or equal to So it's already a non-trivial uh, result to know that. Okay, so, so they did this good stuff, and first thing they did was like no assumptions, water is the allowed space. Here. And it's already very nice because, well, I mean, you know, it's numeric, so this thing is not yet very much converged, but okay. What, what is the constraint? That it's just uh, unitarity and crossing symmetry of this four point function. That's the only thing they, they use. And so the allowed region is here. 
So that's already a very nice result. They get some minimum central charge below this. There's no CFTs. And it looks like what is... They also recover basically numerically the conformal collider bounds because... So the conformal collider bounds imply that you must be here between 0 and pi over 2. So you see that the bounds go up very, very fast after that. And it looks like numerically they are really converging to this vertical line. So this was consistent with everything and already a very nice result. And then you can do other things. So let me just mention. So for example, if you impose that the CFT, if you try to go towards purgarity, what should you do? You should try to impose a big gap, right? To say that all the other operators that can be exchanged here, right, is you write this as a sum where you have here operators being exchanged. S sorry, could you expect also CT to be bigger or equal than 1? Just because it seems to be hard to get less degrees of freedom than one free boson. So actually, we know, we know, well, basically, this work shows that 3Dizing lives somewhere here. So a little bit. Slightly below. 3Dizing is the minimal CT. Um, okay, and so one thing they did, which is very interesting, is to say, let's say, let's assume that all scalar operators have dimension greater or equal to 3, or greater or equal to 3, so it means no value of And they get something like that. I think it's around 2, they get something like that. So it becomes stronger, the bound. No relevant deformations. Yeah. So, uh, when you said in the beginning they had just mu nu and heavy operators. Uh, no, no, sorry. This, this is there was a break here. I should have. Oh, I see. So, so this was motivation, but now they are just doing bootstrap. So they're not putting in any restrictions initially. The first plot there was no restriction. I should probably color here. We have color. So this part was no restriction, just very general, and then this one was with uh, with this no no relevance. <coughs> so this this would be what you call like dead end CFTs, CFTs where you flow through and there's no way to there's no relevant information, so there's no tuning needed to observe the CFTs. Well, that's actually, I, I can already comment on this. I, I find it quite, there's, there's like a tension between the bootstrap and experience. Because in, exper in experiments, we always have to tune to find critical points. It's not, but from the bootstrap, we don't have any strong evidence that there are no CFTs without relevant deformation. Doesn't seem to be a big constraint. I mean, you see, there's a very big allowed region here. But of course, delta zero bigger or equal than three could be a tuning, right? It's like... C? No, delta. Yeah, delta That's C. That's no relevant deformation. Yeah. I, I, I know, but that you're imposing constraints on the CFT. Yeah, but, but if there is a CFT here, then that CFT has some finite basis of attraction, and you should just see it in some material. Uh, without having to tune anything. I guess but you, you would have expected it to be sparse uh, or very but, rare. But you've only imposed the, the crossing symmetry on the TTTT. Sure, and once you put in the first excited state, then you would expect to get many more constraints, right? Sure. So we don't know if you're putting more and more constraints, we remove everything. But uh, well, we don't remove everything, but find discrete points. I mean, it wouldn't be. I don't know. Yeah, but even if you find a discrete point uh, somewhere here without relevant information, it would already be, why don't we find it in the experiment, that CFT in particular, right? I guess. Mm -hmm. What's the minimum CT there? Here, I think it's about two. But I mean, these numerics are not like... Okay. okay. But I'm, I'm going a bit uh, outside the topic. So suppose now you try to be more radical and go towards pure gravity. So there is not just no relevant deformations. You really want to remove all other <laughs> states and only have stress tensor. At large n or finite n? I mean, large CT or finite n? 
Right, so, okay, so good, good point. So, so if you want uh, Einstein gravity in ADS4, so this will imply, well, CT much bigger than 1 because you want something semi-classical, and it will imply actually this theta to be pi over 4. Okay, so nf equals nb, that's what Einstein gravity gives you for... Okay, so you, you, you should go somewhere up there in the middle. So if you increase the gap, is that what you see? I mean, then... So, so what happens when you increase the gap? And that's, that's the main issue. Uh, maybe I'll write it here. So suppose you impose delta. You start increasing the gap, so this goes up and up and up. But, well, I will not draw it, but if you impose delta of spin zero, for even spin zero is enough, greater than about 6.1 or something, there is just no CFTs. So you lose everything. <coughs> Okay. And I, for some of you this is obvious, some of you are confused, and because I, I'm hiding something. I'm hiding the fact that in this theory, of course, there is a scalar which is the double trace which has dimension 6. 6 plus 1 over CT, right? Order 1 over CT. So that's the main challenge for the numerical bootstrap is how to deal with these multi-trace operators. Because if we impose gaps all the way, you just don't have theories, because the theories we want will have these multi-graviton multi states, multi-trace operators. And, uh, and so we don't know any useful way of zooming in on holographic theories by imposing gaps, because from this non-perturbative perspective, there is no sharp distinction between a single trace and a double trace. No, so oh, wouldn't you say that this now is a solved problem? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about dispersive sum rules and uh, a bit later, but uh, <laughs> but it's not yet a solved problem. I think it's it's the frontier okay. it's to try to turn those ideas into a, an algorithm, a numerical algorithm that works here. I think you are a bit closer to the frontier than me, so you, <laughs> you, you can uh, comment on that. But I haven't seen... For example, I think we should try to re-derive 3D Ising using this and see, because even for 3D Ising, this could be better, right? There's double, right? There's double yeah. twist operators in every theory. So, so would the idea be that, okay, you allow this double trace <laughs> operator to have dimension, let's say, six or something like that, and then there is yeah, like so you, you could try, I think at some point right. Alessandro was playing with that, you could try to put some bands, right? You could say, I allow a scalar, so you, you look at the spectrum, and you say, so you have here stress tensor, and then you have the double trace, and well, plus integers, and you just allow states exactly in some band, right? But you see, now it starts to become very dirty, you have to say, well, how big is the the band and many parameters, so it's not a clean problem to do. I mean, it's hard to do the numerics and if you have all these handles. So, so for a DS3, um, it, it, it seems that maybe there isn't just a pure gravity w with, with nothing on it. So, so there is a similar problem, well, it's not similar. Yeah, I will, I will, I will comment on that. Wait, wait, wait for it, if I have This bound on delta naught, was it at finite, was for every C? The delta naught. This one here? Yes. Yeah, this is uh, independent of CT. It just excludes everything. So it sort of tells you that double trace operators cannot get too heavy. Yes. Ah. So there's another, there's another way. We, this one is probably easier to understand. So if you go to spin 4 and you impose the gap. So here, if you impose the gap bigger than... Um, 6 uh, minus epsilon, this already implies, well, you expect this, the, in the numerics they see it growing, but it's hard to see the scaling. CT greater uh, CT, let's say, of order 1 over epsilon. CT scaling like 1 over epsilon. Okay, and this is a, perhaps a bit easier to understand, right? Because the, the normal dimension of this spin 4 guy must be negative, because of the first. In the trajectory. 
and uh, and so at most it can be six. <coughs> so if you, if you put the gap <coughs> close to six, you really need CT to be very large. So so when you push the gaps close to six, you basically lose the. Lose and is the constant in that one over epsilon what comes out of gravity? So the numerics were not good enough to really match this scaling. This was a very hard regime for them. Couldn't you try to solve? They saw it blow up, but they, they couldn't match even the one over epsilon scaling. Yeah. Couldn't you try to solve this problem analytically, given that then there is a small parameter, which is epsilon? Probably, yeah, maybe. That, that probably you can do. Yeah, try to derive this purely from, uh, from CFT analytically, yes. <coughs> Okay, so, so I think that's what I want to say about pure gravity. That's, that's kind of up to the comments that we will come back later on dispersive sum rules. That was the status from the numerical bootstrap. So uh, there another comment maybe about pure gravity is that uh, in, in pure gravity we have uh, also just due to classical theory we have predictions about uh, high energy scattering due to black holes. So there, are, there is this whole sector of predictions due to black holes and gravity waves which was not put in in this analysis, which in principle we know from, from the bulk. Right, but that's a bit twisting the logic. I mean, you can of course do that. You can add properties and then see if it still works. That's true. Yeah, yeah. But, we might be able to but in practice, we don't really know at the moment how to do that in the numerical bootstrap, right? How to input this kind of high energy behavior. Well, maybe some, for example, with, with, uh, with a type of sum rules with a ratio limit and number of subtractions. What we've seen with KLN where you can... Mm. Like ah, if you put one more, subtraction. Right, right, you get one more subtraction. See, but this is really the simplest thing. Yeah, that's a good idea. So, and uh, the expectation is that the parity constraint, which removes that third structure, that that's not very qualitatively won't change things very much. Yeah, I don't think so. You will have one more parameter, but yeah. So let me let me. So, but this is just to to. Well, many people here like supersymmetry. So let's say you want to ask the same question with maximal supersymmetry where we think we should know everything. Okay. So suppose you ask, is there an n equals 4 superconformal field theory in four dimensions? Um, that obeys these properties here. Okay? So you can, so again, people have set up the bootstrap. So I will not give you all those details. But one thing is that you can again look at the four point function of the stress tensor, <coughs> precisely the full stress tensor multiplet in this theory. And then you can use supergravity to compute, say, the leaving, uh, okay, the connected part starts as 1 over n squared, or I'm, I'm using n in terms of the Newton. Okay? And you get some specific four point function, which comes from three level supergravity, it's completely fixed. Because, well, the couplings in supergravity are fixed by supersymmetry, so this is completely fixed. But then, in supergravity, you can also do it to one loop. And then here, things get interesting. Yeah, of course, people can compute more. I think Fernando will explain in more detail what can be done and has been done here. So Fernando has been one of the people pushing this, this one story in the supergravity side. And, um, and what I want to emphasize here is that this part, it depends, it's not universal, in the sense that you can take the, our favorite theory, ADSR cross S5, and you get some answer. But you can also take, so you get a different result, if you just take pure supergravity in S5, some gauge supergravity in S5. Okay? gauge where 5D sugar, which basically means that there's no, you just take no KK modes on S5, right? You just reduce ADSI for S5. And so, of course, at one loop, you see the difference if there are KK modes or not. 
And so you can ask, in this context, can we exclude a UV completion of pure 5D supergravity uh, without the S5? Okay. So take, take my general picture, choose as effective field theory, just pure 5D supergravity without the S5. And is there a UV completion of that without the Calusa Klein modes? So that's a very concrete question with maximal supersymmetry. Is there um, N equals 4 superconformal theory, which is not super young mills? Right. Or super young mills does not give you that. And the answer is we don't know. So in principle, one could exclude that using the bootstrap because I guess the first people that studied this was uh, Hastelli, Van Dries, and Chris Beam. They did this bootstrap for uh, precisely for the n equals four uh, theory in four dimensions, and in principle, you can be very careful by expanding the allowed region in bootstrap results in one over n square and one over n to the fourth, and try to see if you can exclude this difference here. But not yet. So, so that's if you want a simpler question than this one because you have all the maximal <coughs> supersymmetry. And it's still open. And you can also use lots of analytic results, right? There's this Carroll algebra, all this story that in principle would help you classify all maximally supersymmetric superconformal field theories in, in four dimensions. But I mean, there's a conjecture that's only superring mills, but there is no bootstrap proof from first principles. But, but why do we, for this question, I mean, that's, we could just be asking this question about field theory whether there exist any n equals four supermorphal field theories aside from supering mills. We don't have to be a large n or anything for that question, right? True. Even, even that more general question is not being answered, yeah. So is mean? it somehow easier to work at large n for the bootstrap, or? You no, I mean, I, I'm just saying that, that, no, for the bootstrap, it's worth to work at large n. Uh -huh. It's, uh, I was just giving you some motivation because we have some, sure. some nice theory in the bulk that perhaps have a UV completion a good candidate. But is there a similar picture as in the pure gravity case? That I mean, if you didn't do large n and just sort of analyze the pure in the bootstrap? OK, I don't remember by heart. But no, there, there is some allowed region of, say, some OP coefficients that they can bound. And the boundary, they can identify some S, some super and mill series with different gauge group, SU2, SU3. But there is a big allowed region, it's not like they exclude the rest, so, so it's, uh, yeah. I have a, a kind of very nice question. So one of the points upstairs is the 3D icing, right? For 3D icing, what is the constraint that makes this island, you know? No. You know, I mean, for 3D icing, is as far as I know, is the only success story of this in which you can really, you know, get uh, just all one. The, all the model. And actually, yeah. even here, you get very, very small islands if you study, for example, uh, I think the best is now the EBJM. If you yeah. study in 3Ds, maximal superconformal field theory, so the work of Pufu and Chester and collaborators, yes. they get very, very small islands for the yeah. 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 Non so non protected. Yeah. So what is, what is that you have to add to get these islands? Because there are, as you are telling me, there are cases in which these kind of huge bounds become islands, and this is what yeah. is to be missing, right? Uh, you need other operators. So, so there must be some additional condition. Yeah, so uh, for example, there, there is the study of general 3D CFTs, right? I mean, all possible 3D CFTs, including the icing, have to be there, right? So there must be something that people study the icing model add to this mechanism to find this, this island, right? Yeah, so they put more correlators. So they, oh, okay. in the icing model, they, they study the sigma, 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 okay. and the epsilon, epsilon. Yeah, so assume those are the only other and they also put gaps in the spectrum. So here, they all, in this work, they also found an island here by putting gaps, by using what they know yeah, from the I saw, yeah, yeah. And so even just with this correlator, if you put gaps, you say there is only like the epsilon is the first parity even. And mm -hmm. You use the knowledge of the spectrum of 3D icing to... to so Jean, going back to the top board, yeah. If there exists a large CT a CFT, then we sort of know that the four-point function has to be given by Einstein gravity, right? 
if, if there exists a large CT, CFT with uh, yeah. only stress tensor and multi traces. Mm -hmm. This, do you agree that if such a thing exists, its four point function really must be that of Einstein? Right? So, yeah, I was going to discuss that in the second part of my talk. Uh, I think, yeah, let me, let me go. Sorry, when, when, once we have our equations written down, I'll, I'll come. I'm still confused. Okay. So, if you have a gravity theory which doesn't have an ultraviolet completion, what does that tell you about the CFT? Then there is no CFT. There won't be. There won't be a CFT. I just don't see that. Um, what? I mean, so, the property of the CFT which breaks down, what's that property if it doesn't have an ultraviolet completion? What I'm, what I'm calling a CFT is is a proper field theory that already oh, has. Lagrangian proper means. No, proper. it has it has. Okay, in terms of uh, of more bootstrap definition, it will have like a a set of operators with an associative op operator product expansion and with, uh, unitarity, so it, with real OP coefficients. So which of those breaks down if you don't have an ultraviolet completion? I guess that if you have a CFT, then there is a UV completion, but whatever of them breaks down. That's a conjecture, or that's a statement? I mean, what, what is it's kind of a definition. Once, once you have a CFT with all these properties, it is just a healthy quantum mechanical theory, so it is a UV complete theory. It's so that's right. There's no guarantee that an effective field theory has a UV completion, is there? I mean, no you, you start with a UV complete theory and then you integrate out the higher modes. So you go one way, but you don't go the other. So the conjecture is that if you have a CFT, you have an ultraviolet complete <coughs> quantum gravity theory. That's the conjecture. Exactly. And, that's and the conjecture. I like to think about the idea of CFT. Conjecture has no analog if you don't have an ultraviolet completion. There's nothing you can say if you have an effective. You can think that you have an effective CFT yeah. that. You have, a set of op you have a set of operators at low dimension that solve approximately the bootstrap equations, but, uh, but as you go to high dimension, maybe you need like some continuous spectrum or you need some kind of negative squares of OP. I mean, it won't really be an honest to God CFT. In that case, you want to do ABS with it. Can say anything about it? Does it involve Yang Mills? Or do you know that? Or what, what? I don't. I, yeah, I don't know what are the fundamental degrees of freedom in the CFT. If, if there is some Lagrangian that can flow to strong cup. You know Lagrangian. You don't know anything about it. I know. I know what I listed here. Right. I know all the low energy operators because they, the only thing there is is the stress tensor multiplet. And, um, and I know... You can't say if there's a spin one, you can't say anything about it. Of the, of the field content in a Lagrangian sense? No, that, that, that I cannot say. I only know one other n equals 4 SCFT, which is super conformal gravity. n equals 4... That's a sick, that's a sick quantum gravity theory. Does that mean anything? I mean, do you care about anything? <laughs> <laughs> So that's not you in the tree, I guess. Because they have this. Right, but who cares? Well, I mean, what do you care? He gets it. So what would that mean? Do you prefer a dual to the money? I looked at it and I looked at it. Nice question. Could you repeat your question? That's all. I only know one other n equals this. <laughs> We're looking many out from you. You want to put that in the bulk? Or I don't know. At the boundary. It has to be dual to some. Well, I don't know. In your prescription, suppose that's what it gives you. Since you don't know what you get. <laughs> well, the funny thing, as I will discuss, you can compute these things for both cases. But you don't know where they come I, from. So mine is an n equals four SCFT, but it's a sick one. How would you see that it was sick? If you put that in the boundary. Wait, I, I, I guess all the theory, right? Yeah, yeah. So it has yeah. kind of like. It has ghosts that propagate. And but you're going to lose all the positivity, aren't you? I mean, uh, they, they, they have all these positivity. In, they're using positivity all the time that comes so from the universe. So when you say it's for SCFT, it's more than just superconformal. These other computers. Yeah, it has to be so unitary, unitary and uh, local with a unique stress tensor, yeah. And in particular, since you've got gravity, the observables he's computing on the boundary would not be observables at the other 
competing right. correlation functions. Okay. So, so there's no guesses about what it could be? You're just trying to... There is, there is, yeah, there is some guess. I mean, we, we know the low-lying spectrum. There is only this stress tensor multiplet. But, uh, but no, not in some Lagrangian formulation. Suppose you found that there was some other possibility. What would you do with it? What would, you know, what would it teach you? <laughs> well, I mean, in this bootstrap formulation, you could find an island, and then you would just read from there the, the heavy spectrum as a function, say. So, so, I mean, in practice, I'm not emphasizing that language, but what, where it really works is when you, think, when you have a family of CFTs, Right? Parameterized by n, say. I'm just talking about this specific case. Yeah, but it's, it's not one case, right? It's a family parameterized by n. And so you could now bootstrap at finite n and then try to find the island for every n and read off the... You would find a new n equals 4 SCFT, is that right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but I guess here, like, the hope is we want to exclude gauged 5D supergravity as a low-energy effective field theory, right? I mean, that, that's, a, that's a subjective opinion, yeah, maybe. Well, uh, you mean that string theory? Like, if, uh, if you bring comes, your... Everything comes from string yeah, theory. In this... In this uh, we want, theory, like, a 10-dimensional space-time rather than 5-dimensional space-time, so... I guess we want to understand more than exclude or not whether this is possible or not. Yeah, yeah, well, I understand. Keep an open yeah. mind. And keep yeah, yeah. Open mind. Okay. yeah, but like one, one has one, <laughs> what one perspective. Is, is, one perspective is. Yeah. Let me. Let me. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, just a quick uh, question. Just, so, the, the, uh, the, these considerations, uh, would they eventually help you in ruling out or ruling in, or finding this KKLT type of uh, uh, compactifications? Uh, uh, what progress has been made in that direction? Uh, any uh... right? Yeah, I, I I don't know much about this, but indeed there have been some proposals of using that technology to actually make uh, from string theory uh, things that look like this with small small internal space and with lot so with less with less uh, fields. Than this and case. case you're considering is an extreme version of that, right? It's yeah, low internals. In ADS5, uh, yeah. I was asking of oh, oh, oh. the ADS4, oh. which is the one which uh, I guess KKLT really yeah. can. Uh, uh, so, yeah, so in the yeah, ADS4 case, uh, yeah. In principle, yeah, there's uh, Joseph Colon and Quevedo, they have proposed some large volume scenario, which is some other way of. Uh, yeah, and so there are, there are, there are some, uh, some efforts in. Uh, some, yeah. But there's not m no much contact with the bootstrap yet, yeah, that we... But it is an area where yes. I think the bootstrap could say something, uh, yeah. But if you just translate this result, if a similar result exists for ADS4, yeah. Right? Yeah. I think you would conclude that KKLT is, ruled is not ruled out. Right? Yeah, right. right. If you would. Okay, let me, let me make some comments of the equal, about D equals 2, because D equals 2 has a fantastic property, is that all the multigraviton states are packaged in the Virasoro uh, multiplet of the identity. So then we have a sharp way to distinguish this problem that we had here, that we did not put the gap very high because we had all these multigraviton states, into V, it's immediately solved. So, so all the T's and PT's and all the products are contained, say, in the Virasoro multiple of the identity. So you can really ask, what is the maximal gap to the next primary, right? To the next Virasoro primary, and that's a very sharp question. Of course, it's useless to look at the four-point function of stress tensors, because in 2D, that's completely fixed by the central charge. Tells you nothing about the spectrum. But uh, what people have done, starting with Hellerman, is to look at the modular bootstrap. Okay, so this is to, instead of looking at the four-point function, you look at the partition function on the torus. And, uh, and here you see all the spectrum. So you have a sum over all uh, uh, states in the theory, some characters that depend, okay, let's say on beta, and uh, delta L and central charge, and you sum over the spin and dimension. And then, I mean, because this is on a torus, actually, most of the works only explore the rectangular torus, so you have like space is 2 beta, 
and then this is uh, two pi, and this is beta, and you, you identify as usual. And uh, and since this only depends on the ratio because it's a conformal theory, two pi over beta, this must be equal to z of uh, four pi square over beta, right? So so you have here a function that only depends on the spectrum, and it has to have this property, this uh, modular property, and that imposes constraints on the spectrum. Okay? So in particular, you can define a stricter version of delta gap in 2D, which is if you want the minimum value of, uh, of delta, the smallest delta in the theory. And, uh, and this equation, gives you a condition that delta gap um, must be, uh, cannot be too big, so it's bounded, and the bound goes linearly with C, and then there's some number, and this number is a big fight, so Hellman <laughs> got some number. The best now, I think it's the group of Tom Markman, is like 9.1 from the numerics, okay? And you should compare this with the expectation from BTZ black holes. So the lightest BTZ black hole would imply that uh, delta, so delta mean, delta gap, if you want, would be um, C over 12. Okay, so it would be smaller than what uh, this excludes. Okay, so there is some effort to try to see if this 9 can be pushed all the way to 12. And is it 12 or 6? I think 12. 12? Okay. If you define delta yeah, yeah. as h plus h12, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's 24. Yeah. Yes. But is the expectation that if one included all the constraints of the bootstrap, you would land on c over 12, or you would even land? Mm -hmm. um, so, so, so let's see. What, does it, what is this saying? So here is the extreme example of pure gravity in 3D, you're really pushing all the other states as much as possible. And this bound we got from the bootstrap tells you that you can even push it a bit higher than the lightest BTZ black hole, which would be surprising. Would be really like, okay, even if you have pure gravity, at least you should start to have states when the BTZ black hole start and not after. So, but so, you expect so it to the expectation is that if you impose more constraints, for example, one thing that I, I don't think has been tried is to now say, okay, this state exists, so we can look at the four-point function of this party, of this operator, and together with the modular bootstrap and try to see if that system is more constrained. So, but even here, I think the full power of modular invariance when you also have spin tau tau bar has not been uh, explored. It's mostly just this spinless part that has been. Is it a large C? Are we working large C or? Yes. Sorry. So this I'm. I'm. Yeah. For any finite C, you get a bound. So this is the asymptotic bound when uh, when C is large. Yes. But is the expectation that the, that the true bound will be small, strictly smaller than C over twelve, or? I mean. I don't think. Uh, I don't think we know. So so the the theme of this talk will be that bootstrap just confirms effective field theory. So I wouldn't expect it to be smaller. <laughs> But, uh, but I mean, this, I don't know. But, but if, it's, if it's smaller, then it kind of excludes pure gravity. Right. right? Like, uh, you need to have some, some, exactly. some, some part. I mean, bootstrap could exclude it entirely, right? Well, but what does it mean, exclude pure gravity? If, if, pure, if the UV completion of pure gravity needs to have some state which is slightly larger than the lightest PTZ black hole, but is still in the Planck scale, I mean, this would. I would I mean, still call it I think any proportion, anything mm -hmm. proportional to yes. C. I mean, anything uh, proportional to C would be pure gravity well, for yeah. practical purposes. I mean, a very concrete proposal is pure gravity where you're allowed to have an orbifold singularity, right. but yeah. nothing else. And then you would get yeah. Yeah. something less than that. But this for a superconformal, has this been done? Or the superconformal analog? I mean, this is pure Verisoro, what you're describing. Uh, good question. I, I don't use it. I don't remember. Do you know if, you, if someone did the... So there were all these old discussions with Mat Matthias participated in, starting with Maloney and Witten, mm -hmm. about how, looking at the partition function, there were suggestions that, from that point of view, it had to go below C over, C over 12. <clears throat> that has not, there's been no matching with that. 
I think that was the spirit of Mat Matthias's question. So. Yes. You know, the, I mean, monster, the monster type uh, analysis. And there, there was, a, I mean, while the partition function was okay, when you looked at it more carefully, it seemed unlikely that there would be a consistency of T. But there, there you imposed this holomorphic factorization. Sure. I mean, that was a special case, absolutely, but. Um, but Maloney and Witten didn't impose holomorphic factorization. They, they didn't. But they also had negative. They, uh, 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 this, the, the question was suppose you had a partition function which was just the beaters. I'm sorry, we can talk about it later. No, no, it's good, it's good. But they also, well, you, you can. It was just the identity block plus modulate. Right. That gives you negative, some, some states with negative multiplicity. But that is fixed if you add the overfold. Well, that's, that is fixed if you add the overfold? Yeah, you, you, get, you get a positive spectrum, a positive discrete but you get spectrum. Integers. Yeah. Well, it's discrete. You get integers? Probably. Uh, yeah, I think so. That's Mal what paper I Maloney recently. Really? Mm -hmm. You get integers? You I think so. You pick all the images. No, and then just no I don't think you get integers. I, that, that's I, I, get, you get, I think you get a con so for what they have in their, their last, like, later papers, uh -huh. you get a continuous distribution. And they don't mind it because of all this averaging uh, distribution. There was sort of some problem. Oh, okay. uh, I'm not talking uh, about. Oh. I mean, it wasn't the good. That's right. So, so I think the statement was, first you can do what they did by adding up all the images of the identity. That gives you two problems. It gives you a continuous distribution, and it gives you also some states with negative multiplicity, yeah, yeah. and that you can solve by adding some conical singularities. The, the, the second part you can solve. The, but not the, the second first. part, but not the first part. Yeah. It's still a continuous distribution. Which may be OK. If we think of some other edge. Okay for you. No, no, it's not okay for me. But that, that's what they say. Yeah. Yeah. It's not okay for me. Okay. <laughs> okay, so in the 2D context, there's another interesting thing you can do. Is you can you can kind of define holographic CFTs in a in a broader sense and, and perhaps even yeah, in a broader sense. So this was this is this famous paper of um, HKS. Uh, Hartman, Keller, and Stoika. And, and basically, what they showed is that this condition that I was calling one large n factorization, they just say, okay, central charge just goes to infinity. So they're not imposing any specific factorization. And then they replace two by a much uh, looser constraint. They, they say the spectrum has to be sparse in the sense that if you take the, um, the density of states, it cannot go faster than exponentially when delta is less than, uh, I think it's C over 12. And they show that if these two conditions are satisfied, in any to the CFT, you get uh, a universal free energy, which is exactly what you get from, uh, uh, from black hole thermodynamics, okay? So from the DPZ black hole thermodynamics. So this is a, an interesting suggestion, and the, the intuition. Um, so the intuition comes. So if you take, say, the log of this density of states, you can have typical behavior. So if this goes linearly, this is some kind of stringy behavior, some Agadorn growth of um, of density of states, and if it goes um, sublinearly, so I think it's like d minus one over d would be from uh, some effective field theory, some field theory in uh, ABS trees cross some internal space, which is of the same, that wh whose range is the same order. <coughs> and so you can do this distinction between uh, stringy growth and supergravity growth. So, sorry, is delta to the? D minus one, oh, sorry. My d's and deltas are almost the same, yes. So, d, d minus one over d. <clears throat> okay, so uh, so actually, I want to make some comments about the, this more general setup in higher dimensions. But before, let me make a comment. So this led uh, some people, like uh, Alex Bellan, I fear all the names, Bellan, Benjamin Castro, Harrison, and Keller, to actually do a direct search. Okay, which is one of the rare papers that tries to address my my first question head on, it's like, can we actually look 
in the space of 2D CFTs for CFTs that solve these problems, that obey these two constraints. And so what they tried was to look at symmetric products of superconformal field theories in, uh, in two dimensions. And they tried to see if inside this big class of CFTs, where you can choose a superconformal field theory and you take n to infinity, you would solve these two constraints. Okay? Of course, the first you will solve, because as n goes to infinity, central stars will go to infinity, you're taking n copies. But the second is non-trivial. And so what they did was to say, well, we cannot really compute. I mean, if we just take um, this undeformed symmetric product, <coughs> this will be violated. This will grow much faster. Or at least it will grow not a supergravity type. So what they said is, OK, I will have to deform this. Right? But that will go into strong coupling, and so I don't know how to compute. But some things I know how to compute, like the index. Because after the deformation, the protected states will still be the same. So I can at least count the protected states and check if the protected states grow like stringy or go like supergravity. And so they impose those two conditions, that uh, log rho, uh, if you want, protected, um, is uh, supergravity type, delta to d minus 1 over d. And another condition is that you have to have a marginal deformation that allows you to deform in the twisted sector so that you couple the copies and you have at least a chance of lifting the, the unprotected operator. So is there any minus 1 to the f in this counting of the index? Yes, yeah, so this is an index. So this is not the full row, it's just the row the protected sector that you count with an index. So technically they computed the index of this and they studied this. And the, uh, the seed superconformal field theory, you keep it at some fixed seed. It's also an answer. So they, so they did this analysis and of course these two conditions are necessary but they are not sufficient. Okay, so. But uh, they are already quite restrictive, so they show that there are solutions. Okay? But the superconformal field theories cannot have, I think, maximum was six, the central charge. Mm -hmm. If you go higher than the solutions. And, uh, and they have some big list of examples where actually these two necessary conditions go through. So what does the second point say? Marginal deformation. Ah, marginal. In the twisted sector. <coughs> So that, uh, so that it couples, uh, so that it couples the different copies, and uh, and you can. I mean, this is a generalization of uh, the story that uh, Rajesh and Matthias was telling us about. So, what did they get for big D? Uh, good question. Uh, I forgot. I don't remember. Uh, yeah, I should check. I, let me not speculate. Uh, they had several concrete examples, right? There are several mm -hmm. concrete examples that work. Yeah. They passed these two tests. And now it's completely unclear what, what else to do. That's the question. You search for supergravity solutions that will match this index. Yeah. I thought certain of their examples matched with these orbifolds we had analyzed before, for which you have a supergravity description and, a, and actually a world sheet description, but many examples don't. Okay. So, but there are some new supergravity, some new ads that have been discovered. Yeah, but I mean, they are basically sort of the usual orbifolds of, orbifolds. Orbifolds of the, the maximal supersymmetric stuff. Yeah. Because I mean, the, I think there are n equals to 2, otherwise the index is trivial, so it's a usual game. No. So, so I just wanted to, uh, as a general question, is it known how many out of the full number of states is actually protected? <laughs> to me, protected looks like a little point in a sea of operators and... Like, are they supposed to be like half of the operators? Or I mean, one you know, the black hole counting, they're, they're essentially right. Right. everything. So, for large, the idea is that for large delta, they should be like yeah. fraction. Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I think the idea is under marginal deformation, what can get lifted will get lifted. Right. So, yeah. I mean, that's, I'm not sure whether that's true, but that's sort of the working principle. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe one comment about. Ten years ago, we performed a similar analysis for 
uh, Matter and Simon's supersymmetric theories. Once again, three dimensions. Also. Three dimensions. We looked at various classes of Matter and Simon's theories and asked for the superconformal index not to grow exponentially. And uh, there again, it was very, very restrictive. Of course, ABGM does not grow. But we found basically one more example, one n equals three theory. And then several years later, Jefferis and collaborators found the supergravity view of that. But even that was very and, and can that be obtained from some brain construction theory? Or yeah, they had some or massive it to a background. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I can't remember all the details. But it was extremely restrictive. You know, because you just add in three dimensions, you can add as much matter as you want. Because there's no beta function restriction unlike in four dimensions. Okay? And when you add sufficient amount of matter, the index grows exponentially. So basically, for it not to grow exponentially, of the infinite number of matter fields you could add, there's only a very small finite set you can. So again, it's very restrictive. And the one case that was non, not known previously, a supergravity solution was eventually discovered. I see. I didn't know this example. Thank you. But I mean, here they are just looking at the index. And that's, uh, I mean, they're going to find zillions and zillions and zillions of examples, because it's a very weak criterion. In I mean, two dimensions. In two dimensions. In the bigger scheme of things. So therefore, you shouldn't be surprised if you find lots of problems. But we did the same in three dimensions. We took just an index. Very, very few. We examples. didn't use anything but except for yeah, analyzing the index. Common index. Yes. We did a little more, but but mainly it was just the superconformal index. And even the, there was very few examples. But you said matter transcendence, so you have some sort of uh, right, right. The form, the framework is matter transcendence. Then we add different gauge groups and different amounts of matter. Yeah, but that's and then look for examples where it does not grow. Infinite class. It's infinite, infinite class, but it's still a much more, much. I mean, you know that basically you're always. Yes, yes. I mean, here you are on your own, right? I mean. Well, here they do something similar. They look at symmetric products, right? But they look at symmetric products of. Of. But you can do more than look for symmetric products. So it's, once again, it's narrowing some framework. Right? Sorry, 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 sorry. <laughs> Remember, I'm, I'm in therapy. So you also have to speak. <laughs> So, so this, I think this is a, actually this is something that Alex Bond has emphasized to me. There's a big difference between this definition of holographic CFTs in two dimensions and the one I wrote in the beginning for higher dimensions. And, um, and this suggests there should be a broader definition also in higher dimensions. And just so that you have something in mind, imagine that you have not just one coupling, so you still have Gravi the gravity sector to be weakly coupled, so Planck length is very small, but you could have a matter sector which is strongly coupled. And, right, so for example, suppose you have uh, young Mills in ADS4, and, uh, and now you, you choose your lambda young Mills times r to be of order 1. Okay, so you, you will have weakly coupled gravity, but this will be very strongly coupled. So, what do you do in this case? Is this an holographic theory, an holographic CFT, or not the dual of this? Okay. I, I think, in some sense, we should say yes, because, well, this is just some gravity... Pure young mills. mills. Pure young mills. Yeah. I say pure young mills, for, for example. But anything, as long as you have matter which is strongly coupled, will already not fall in the classification I gave in the beginning. So, yeah. You're considering the CFT on ADS? Are, no, uh, what are you doing? Young Mills and ADS. Yeah. Yes. So this is like a super gravity theory with gauge That's fields. Uh, with a gauge a sector which is strongly coupled. Okay. Yeah. But, but there is a gravity theory. Your yeah. gravity, yeah. Sectors, gravity theory, the matter sector is strongly coupled. Uh, that's more or less where we live, no? <laughs> So, <laughs> the so, the so, so you still have multi-gravitons, right? Exactly. So the Hilbert space in this case will be like a, a factor from matter, which is not a Fox space, it's very complicated, but it's tensor with a Hilbert space for gravitons, which becomes a Fox space in the, uh, in the parametric limit uh, um, RL1 to infinity. Right? So it's a bit more general, but we still have this structure that at least gravitons form a Fox space. 
But you see, inside here, you will have operators with any spin, or ever spin 4, which have dimension of order 1, right? Because some strongly coupled sector, and it's, there is no way to count particles inside that sector. So, so my first definition will not apply here, right? So the question is, in this setup, what is the, the proper way to define the scale of non-locality in the bulk? Okay. Is there a way to, um, to, to characterize the scale, the energy scale, at which you don't have a field theory and you really go into string theory or some really quantum gravity theory? Okay. Of course, you could say it's just a Planck length, but that could not be like that. You could have some string effects entering before. So I, I think that's uh, an important question. I mean, there is a hint from here, right? You could look at the density of states and say that uh, log uh, of the density of states, if it grows, if it grows power-like, uh, some power less than one, for delta, uh, of course, much greater than one, but up to some scale r times let's say uh, lambda uv maybe this is the scale and after that it would grow stringy right for delta greater than r uv maybe this is one way of characterizing so this this transition in the density of states would be a way of characterizing the the non-locality scale in um, in this type of theories so lambda uv is the scale of the strongly coupled matter sector? No, no, it's the scale, right? That, that one is order one. Oh, I see. This would be the, if you want, the analog of the string scale. Oh. Where, where it really becomes non-local in the string scale. Is there any example of yeah. the setup? Do we know a string? Uh, uh, concrete, yeah, you be complete. You example of brain construction. I don't. It seems very difficult to rig something up like this in string theory. But yeah, but that, that goes, well, I just erased it. That's precisely the tension again in this set. If you take the perspective that the CFT is just UV completing some effective field theory, you don't see any particular. And if you take the perspective that this is just some very special duality between highly supersymmetric things that come from string theory, then uh, so, so these two perspectives, I think we, we still don't know which one is the, the right perspective. Well, we have to search for one example, right? It would teach us a lot. Nice. Is that some you, you're right? so I mean, some brain construction. Some brain construction. So, so you're not allowing like yes. doubly holographic things because those are not UV complete or something? Is it? Oh, yeah, no, I, I pr personally prefer something, you know, starting from 10 dimensions to but, but you know, the way you, know, you get strong coupling in string theory with, while having the bulk weakly coupled is by putting a lot of brains, right? right, mm -hmm. right. So, so Tuft coupling becomes large while coupling is small. Maybe is there some way of doing that? Some, some system of brains. Right. Yeah. Brains. Uh, may, would, would you mind? I, su would you, I, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, it's a good suggestion, yes. Cool. I mean, you can make these gauge theories by looking at local clubbias, right? Whatever gauge theory you want. So then it's a matter of basically embedding that in a global clubbia, right? You can always, yeah. There are subsectors of CFT that do behave a bit like this. Anyway, some D3, D7 systems, and you can look at the open strings on the D7. Right. And then if you look up to some order in 1 over n, then it behaves like this, but it's not non perturbative, of course. Once you. But the, that one, like I, I saw, like the coupling on the like open string, coupling of op, open string, and also coupling between open and closed, all yes, but what, governed by one of my n, right? So. No. So the, the, the coupling between uh, three open strings goes like one over n, and two opens to a close goes like one over n squared. Okay, but so there, that, there is not really parameter. Okay. Right. So the, at some order, it it's will a, kick in. Different, it's but at three level, you can study the, okay. the, the gluon problem. I see. But actually, I, I can mention something. Okay. Yeah, actually, there, there was one example, which is like D, D1 in ADS5 times S5, and which was discussed by Aharoni. 
And in that example, you can actually keep D1 strongly coupled and turn off the gravity, like a couple into the closed string. Great. Right. Now that violates Lorentz and Yeah, yeah. But yeah, that's like a, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. a defect. So. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Something like that that preserves Lorentz and Yeah, yeah. If there is something like that that preserves the Lorentz invariance, that would be great. I was thinking of something. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So. That was the first part of my talk. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so this was about the, we defined a set, or well, the best way we could. The definition is not entirely rigorous, as we can see here. And uh, we're trying to see if there are theories inside this set. But now the second type of question is, OK, assume this set is there. What else can you prove about theories in, in this set? So, so this, there has been a lot of work in this direction. So just you take these two conditions, large n and large gap, and then you ask, does this imply gravitational, uh, gravitational physics? So, and then we can, we can uh, right? so because these were two very vague conditions, like just some weak coupling and some spectrum condition, but now there's many, many observables that we can gravity, and the question is, are these indeed, indeed sufficient to imply all of that? And uh, the most studied example is correlators. Okay, and so this uh, goes back to the question that Shiraz asked uh, some time ago. So, um, so, 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 just so if you want to include this example, so strongly coupled QFT, you can exchange two. To the statement that to leading order in one over CT you get GR. Right? This will cover both examples. So this is for what observable? <coughs> Four point functional stress tensor. Okay. But okay. But that's uh, that's uh, maybe it's enough. That's a hard uh, that's a very detailed uh, request, right? A full four point yeah. function. But but yeah, maybe that's enough. Full endpoint function will match GR. What's the answer? Right, but you see here, this is what I'm trying to, to imply is that does one and two, right? So, so the question I want to say here is precisely suppose you have one and two, and then you compute now in these CFTs the, the endpoint functions of stress tensors, and the expectation from the bulk is that they are all. Uh, well, they scale with this large parameter, and they are all fixed by the by GR, as you say, with corrections that decay like one over this delta gap squared. Right, so that that would be the strongest form of this uh, conjecture would be to prove that one and two imply this. So, okay, of course you can put this in, in the definition, but it's much more detailed information. So, better known, I don't know, maybe I shouldn't give so much detail, but, well, let me, let me do it anyhow. So, so um, well, this is the general statement, so let's start in the three-point function. Okay, so the three-point function we already we already discussed. <coughs> has, well, in 3D it has two structures, but in four and higher it has three possible structures. And so you can write it as a linear combination of uh, what you get from from GR, so from from pure Ricci scalar, and then other other terms that come from. Uh, R square in the bowl and R cube in the bowl. Okay. And of course there are coefficients here. And if you use your uh, defective field theory intuition, these terms will be suppressed by the heavy scale. Because well I, I was planning to write that. It's better still to write it, I will write it. Yes. Uh, it's proportional to the integral of 
So you have Ricci, and then you have corrections, R squared and R cubed, and so on. Sorry, these are curly R's, these are curvatures. And here, in principle, you have some OP Wilson coefficients, but you expect it to be suppressed by the heavy scale square here, this by dimensional analysis, and you have a, another one here suppressed by the heavy scale to the fourth. And if you identify, like we did, this heavy scale as R times MA, as delta gap, then here you expect a suppression with delta gap square, with some coefficient, and here with delta gap four, with some other coefficient. And, um, and now the question is, can you prove that one and two do imply Right, so the question is 1 plus 2, does it imply that uh, bounds on C1 uh, and bounds on C2 with some numbers which should be uh, order 1, so these numbers are order 1. Right, so that's a sharp question for the three-point function. Yes. And, uh, and this was studied by Sasha and collaborators in this famous paper using causality in the bulk, and indeed they find that both C1 and C2 should be on the one, but they are not able to derive sharp bounds with the causality arguments. And, well, for this specific problem, this is still the status. Sorry, but I mean, that's the supergravity analysis, or that's the bootstrap analysis? When you say uh, causality, you mean causality... This was mostly a bulk analysis, yes, in this uh, paper of Sasha. But then if you look at the bootstrap, do you reproduce yeah. this? So, so that's, that's what's happening at the moment. So, yeah, let me go here. So what you want to show basically is that C1, C2 does, don't depend on delta gap. Yes. Because if they did, they would screw. Yeah, but this bound value is just pure numbers. And uh, so at the moment, there is no published work with those bounds, but there are published works with the, with the methods to get those bounds. So hopefully, it will be a, a matter of time. And this goes by the name of this dispersive sum rules. So, so the paper that gets closer they didn't do the stress tensor analysis, they did some scalar. Was well, paper by Hasselli, Mazart, uh, David Simon Duffin, and, and Simon Caronwa. And, um, and so, I mean, I, I don't have time to give you ma many details, and maybe we can discuss more in the afternoon. Even that even Sasha is here. Uh, gap here means gap for spin greater than two? Yeah, so here it's, I will went back to the first, uh, to the first definition, yeah. So, um, so what are these dispersive sum rules? Just very briefly, so you look at the four-point function, so you look at the four-point function and you decompose as a sum of two blocks, let's say you have here some external, let me do scalar for simplicity with dimension delta zero. And, uh, and so the, the four-point function is some sum over these exchange operators with OP coefficients associated here. Let me call them lambda. So this lambda delta L square is the square of OP coefficient. And then this dispersive sum rules is just some specific sums that vanish. Okay, so they are derived in, in many different ways, but the main property, that's why we call them dispersive, well, the main property is that uh, they have double zeros precisely at the double trace operators. Okay. So, so these sum rules, if you plot it across the delta, they will have like two delta zero, two delta zero plus two plus integers. And if you plot this W, here it can do many different things, but at some point it will start to only have double zeros at all double trace. And be positive or physically large? Yeah, the good ones, the more useful ones are positive 
as you go up in delta. Yeah. And, uh, and you see now, with this set of constraints, so there is many of these, there's an infinite set that you can use of these dispersive sum rules. And, uh, and in this paper that I mentioned, they studied uh, scalars and they studied the analog uh, question for, for scalars and they, and they indeed derived sharp bounds using this technology. So it, it seems that it's really just a matter of time of writing it down here. So I think now the, the main uh, open question, the main frontier here, is to really transform this new uh, dispersive sum rules and to incorporate them in an efficient numerical bootstrap so that we can go back to, the, um, to a systematic analysis that it's much more efficient and tuned, optimized for all graphic theories because we automatically exclude the contributions of these double trace operators. Sorry, I missed the... Um, can you just say again what, where that equation comes from? I didn't say. It comes from, from many places. You can... Uh, one way is to start with the double discontinuity that automatically has this property. And then you can do some integrals. You can also do start from the Mellin amplitude, the Mellin representation of the four-point function, and do some dispersion relation. You also get something like that. And also from light ray operators, from some commutate, commutativity of light ray operators. So there are many ways to derive this type of sum rules, but um, uh, this is the main uh, advantage of the sum rules, is that they are very optimized for uh, or all graphic theories, but I think they will be useful more general because this kind of double twist operators, they are actually a generic thing in, in control field theories like Sasha and collaborators show. Um, okay, I'm already, I have one more page, but maybe, maybe I'll just say it in words. But what about- I think you can take uh, some, we have yeah. half an hour to lunch, so. Okay. But, uh, <laughs> don't, don't hide your troubles. <laughs> Tell us all. <laughs> Just in one session, I will. I will be cured. <laughs> the most important point. <laughs> yeah. So this one. Uh, well, I will mention because it's, it's another important example of this general class of questions, but maybe it will fall on the class of a too hard problem like, uh, like she has. So I, I, I don't know if it's, if it's doable or not, but I think it's good to at least know it is there. Uh, which is, well, one and two, it feels like gravitational physics, and we know gravitational physics has lots of concrete predictions for thermodynamics, for finite temperature and finite density states. So can we use that? For example, if you look at the entropy density of a CFT at finite temperature, so by dimension analysis has to be t to the z minus 1, and there's some number, let's call it Cs. And, um, and if you use uh, the gravitational description, so if you use the fact that uh, in the, air, the, the entropy of a black hole is the area over 4G Newton, then uh, this implies that Cs is equal to Ct up to some known function that only depends on space-time dimension. So this is some gamma function. And uh, we expect this to be true corrected just by this delta gap, right? This is, this is what... So a natural question is, can you again use... Right, so the conjecture, if you want, would be that if you take condition one plus condition two, you should be able to prove this relation, right? And... Uh, and the same goes for other, other thermodynamic purposes like transport coefficients, eta over s is 1 over 4 pi, 
plus small fractions, right? One plus small fractions, and, and, and so on and so forth. There's lots of predictions from hydrodynamics that you get from gravity that, in principle, if such theories exist, should be automatic. But here, um, well, the natural thing is say, can we do a finite temperature bootstrap? Right? Finite temperature bootstrap. And this has been attempted, and there's already some, some efforts. Um, so one way of doing it is to look at the two-point function, and then you, you use the OPE and the unknowns. Tac, 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 tic, tac. Okay. So you look, say, at the two-point function, at finite temperature, and uh, let's say it like we were. So you, this cor corresponds to putting the CFT on a circle of radius beta. So this is if you want tau, the, uh, the equilibrium coordinate becomes periodic with period beta. And so you can, there is one thing you know about this, uh, maybe I'll be more explicit, tau 1 and x1 like space and tau 2 and x2 and so if you this is periodic right so the one property you know is that if you shift tau by beta this should be periodic okay and then the other thing you know is that you can compute it using the OPE okay. you can compute it using the OPE and so that reduces to some sum of operators. So you'll have some explicit functions. You'll have the OP coefficients, I say one, two, and we just put k, k. Some explicit functions that depend on uh, uh, so one minus tau two and x one minus x two. And then there is the one point function of the operators k on the thermal vacuum on the thermal state, and this uh, just by scale scale uh, invariance is just beta to the delta k times some number. So these are the only unknowns. Okay? If you already knew the peak coefficients, it would be the unknowns, and you have to find these unknowns such that the periodicity is there. So this would be one way of setting up the thermal bootstrap. Uh, but so far, we have not been really able to, right? This, this, this one-point functions would amount to knowing this type of coefficient. And that would include all multi-trace operators, right? Yeah, right. Because yeah. in the thermal background, each trace has a yeah. and it's, it's, station value in. Yeah. And, and also operators with spin, as long as you have only the components of the, along the time direction also gets Right, right. But so it's a complicated right. problem, and that's, I mean, and uh, Fernando did, did some, some of this more on the gravity side, and I think the first person that proposed this was in a paper by Kirillov and Shiro uh, Shork that proposed this idea. Then David Simons and collaborators pushed it further, and, and Sasha and uh, Fernando also worked on this. Well, because my problem is that one point functions are not so indefinite, and this. I mean, AK can be right. either side. Yeah. Yeah. Ah. That, that, that kind of kills the numerics, yeah. So, so here, yeah, maybe it's too hard, I don't know. Wait, but, but just, just to understand, so on the right-hand side, even like trace to the power 20 would appear, right? Mm -hmm. Same order in 1 over n as just one trace, because the trace has an extra power of n because of uh, trace of stress tensor. Yeah. Only for trace. At least in holographic theories. Right, because yeah, that's yeah. the only thing yeah, that I yeah, expect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but more generally, more generally everything. Yeah. yeah. So a trivial comment is that, that this part is easy in 2D, right? In 2D, this is automatic, the central charge controls all of this. Sorry, after, uh, just about that, I, you, you stopped at three-point functions for the... Sorry, I, it was the time, yeah, sorry, I should go back, you're right, yeah. I didn't make the comment. So Shiraz worked on the four-point function case, and that, that was not the only reason. End of the comment. Maybe just to save myself embarrassment, what I wanted to ask is what, what is known about 5 to i over? 
quite fun. I mean, next to nothing, I think. Yeah. Is there some idea? Are there some ideas for fixing them? Yeah, actually, uh, good that you asked because I wanted to emphasize that. Yeah, this this looks like a hopeless problem because if we do one by one, <laughs> yeah. point, 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 we need a more systematic idea to to kill the problem all at once. And uh, but there is two ways. I mean, there's two levels. One level is to say, suppose delta gap is infinity, and then you must converge to GR. Yeah. This is somewhat easier, and this is what you Another is to really say, prove a bound on the corrections in terms of delta gap. Right. And this is why, I mean, this is why it took so long, and it's still an unfinished business at this point. Let's say we try the first simpler problem. Yeah. Uh, what really helped for four-point functions was this chaos bound. This, this inequality. I was wondering if anyone has any ideas for extensions of this chaos bound to higher point functions. Seems like there should be some non-trivial extensions too. If you keep the other fix, right, you, you can take some... You can take them in groups, you're saying. Right. But there should be something more than that, right? Or oh, hopefully. Uh, it feels like that, that's the missing ingredient to go to. Some, some bounds and growth of these, these guys for higher point functions. Is anything known about them? The analog what Sasha just worked on for four particle scattering, for instance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What is known about this for higher? I guess the natural conjecture is that a, G, a radial limit cannot be faster than NGR, right? That would be the, the conjecture. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I don't have anything to add. Yeah. Just, I think one comment, uh, which is that it's hard even to start thinking about these high dimensional points in terms of, say, dispersion relations, etc. But uh, if you think of this dispersive samples in terms of commutativity of light rays, mm. this is kind of trivially generalized to, uh, to uh, high point functions, and commutativity of light rays is directly sort of closely related to the bound of chaos. Because uh, yeah, so commutativity of light rays is nothing but the bound on the radial limit. So if you say that all the light rays commute for stress tensors, at least this is a version of it. Maybe it's not optimal. One. Did you get S squared from that? Or S cube? <clears throat> yeah, for stress tensor it was... Uh, so f for stress tensors to commute, you, we needed uh, cube. Cube 3 was enough. But I guess if we consider... Um, um, maybe not the stress tensor, but other light ray, maybe kind of light ray with an insertion of you know, generalized light ray where you just not integrate stress tensor, but it may be possible to. then it will become two. So it, it should be commutativity of maybe slightly generalized light rays. But okay, yeah. okay. Yes. Yes, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, you, uh, you mentioned one way was the finite temperature bootstrap. Did you have something else in mind? or uh, uh, very, very, I had a very comment that you could go back to the four-point function and look at heavy, heavy, light, light. Heavy. Because you can prepare the thermal state with some heavy state that it's like the micro ensemble. Um, and so in, in 2D, this has been a good path. And Liam and Matt Walter, they, they did the so, uh, Yeah, so that was, so my follow-up so, was in 2D, you can use the, I mean, the modular bootstrap tells you about, uh, would give you that relation, presumably, no? Uh, right, but it, you see, in 2D, another thing is that this is, uh, you can get thermal state by a conformal transformation as well. Right? So, yeah. So it's kind so of automatic. That exactly. thermal physics, at least, in infinite uh, space is as easy as the vacuum. Right. Uh, uh, yeah, so in 2D there is that, but I'm just wondering whether you can push that to other things in 2D, not just the first relation that you wrote down. Uh, or, I mean, maybe the, I don't know, the corrections. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, I think. How, uh, uh, how much can you push? Yeah. Uh, how much can you push things? No, in two D, there is no corrections. It's really like this is central charge. This is central charge. And, uh, CFTs. You don't have to input any other. It's just a universal statement of two D CFTs. That right is the entropy density. Okay. This is the high energy. Right. Right. And so yeah, I guess you don't need large. C for that. Uh, you don't even need large C, it's just completely. Uh, the, this thing, yeah. Uh, uh, but uh, other thermodynamic 
on. Yeah. No, uh, I was just seeing whether the 2D modeler bootstrap buys you some more uh, things for the thermodynamics. Uh, or yeah, I think if it's if you put finite volume, then it's very rich, right? You now you have torus partition function that knows a lot of physics, theory dependent. But if it's really S one times R, it's uh, it's very universal. It's too universal. Okay, so the last part I want to tell you about is very decoupled. It's just it's simpler, so it's a concrete. Uh, it's more on the easy side of the problem. So. So this is, I just want to invite you to think about young mills, let's say pure young mills, S-U-N, young mills on ADS-4. And, uh, okay, let me just give you a bit of motivation for that. So, so this goes back to Carl and Wilshek that I thought about this. No, no gravity. There's no gravity. There's no gravity now. It's a, it's a big chart transition. Mm -hmm. Now I'm not doing ADS CFT, I'm just, well, still using ADS, but this is a fixed geometry. You're doing ADS QFT. Exactly. Quantum field theory in ADS. It's just ordinary yin not super yin This is ordinary pure yin -Gos. I mean, you can also do super, but yeah, let me focus on that. So that, that is a, a very nice paper by Aroni, Berkus, Tong, and Jan Kelovitz that discussed this. And, uh, and I want to emphasize some, some aspect of it which connects with the conformal bootstrap, so uh, it's just a provocation. Okay, so, so what's, uh, what's the characteristic features of this? So of course you have a scale, lambda and mills, times r, so that's a dimensionalized parameter that tells you what type of theory you have. And let's start when this is very small. So that means you have basically just three gluons, uh, in ADS-4, but three gluons in ADS-4, we know what they are on the boundary, they are just uh, conserved currents, so you have n squared minus one conserved currents, and they're multi-traces, okay, so it's what we call a generalized free theory on, on CFT3, okay? But now there's another, another thing which I think makes this very interesting, is that you have to put boundary conditions. And I like the boundary conditions that are uh, sometimes called magnetic or, or Neumann boundary conditions. Because if you choose these boundary conditions, this just tells you that the flux of the electric field is zero, so impose the Gauss law that you only allow singlet states. Okay, so this projects the spectrum to uh, SUN singlets okay. at any coupling, okay, even even in this free theory. So the the spectrum of the of the theory with these boundary conditions at zero coupling is the tensor product of so the flux space of these free gluons with this projection to singlets. Okay. So we can plot it. So let me just do this plot. Last plot I will do. So as a function of this coupling, lambda and mills times r, we can plot the spectrum. Okay? So the spectrum in ADS4 is the bulk spectrum with respect to global time is the same as the dimensions of the boundary operators. So let me call them delta. And so the first state starts at 4. It's just this JMU, JMU. Uh, if you want to trace, right, to make a singlet out of two gluons, there is only one state. And then, well, you can put derivatives, you can take more gluons, you will have some integer, integer spectrum with uh, uh, some degeneracy. And now the question is, what happens when you turn on the coupling? And here there is a very simple scenario, is that you just move continuously into the confining phase without any phase transition because you are already confined since the beginning. You already have singlets. So this seems to be a regime which connects perturbation theory with the confining phase without any phase transition. 
So in particular, what do you expect? You expect that the lightest state will turn into the lightest glue ball, so this will go like M1 times R, and then the second lightest will go into some other second glue ball that goes like M2 times R, and so on and so forth, until you, have, you run out of stable glue balls and you go with some continuum with the same slope 2M1 times R, right? So you go to the two-particle continuum. N is finite in what you're doing here. This N is finite. Okay, so these masses that you would read off from here are the blue ball masses. So what's the advantage compared to like compactifying the egg mills on S3? Exactly. It's very similar, this, this picture. The advantage is that is that um, you can look at these operators and do the conformal bootstrap for these operators mm -hmm. because they, they will satisfy all the bootstrap equations except there's no stress tensor but that doesn't change the, the game. So my, my vision, my, my dream would be to, well I'm telling you this because some of you are very good with perturbative computations in, uh, in young mill theory, some efficient methods to compute uh, scattering amplitudes with gluons should be somehow generalizable to this perturbative regime where you are in AVS4. So here you could compute, in principle, many orders in perturbation theory if, if one finds an efficient way of doing that. By orders you mean loop orders rather loop than... Loop orders, yeah. So you can do many <laughs> particles but many loops is harder. Well, this idea was put, uh, was put forward in the 80s by Lusher, exactly what you're saying. Uh, okay. you, you know, I mean, you know that you, know, you, compact, you, co you co compactify extrapolation from perturbation theory, my actually give you the masses in the infinite radius limit. So he actually was doing just R3 times S1, but the idea is the same. So you don't right. have to do ADS4 or anything. Right, right. So, so as I said, so, so, so to do perturbation plus some resummation, I agree. You don't have to do any any. Just, just, you, you, need, you need a scale. You need a, you need a scale. You need exactly. a radius so this, this that sets. Uh, but uh, there is a very beautiful paper, 1982, by Lusher, where he discusses this actually the nonlinear sigma model. Uh, yeah, I completely agree with that. But here there is this new tool, which is the conformal bootstrap. Yes. Which you see, you have to. So there will be a solution of the conformal bootstrap equations that has a one-parameter family that you should be able to follow continuously from this perturbative regime into the strong coupling regime. And, uh, well, okay, that's... Uh, but this is, by, this is by assuming that you can use this CFT description, right? I mean, but it's not really an assumption, it is true. I mean, it's, it's not a CFT in the sense that it's not... I, mean, I should probably remove the F. It's a conformal theory, it's not a field theory, it's not local, yes, it's yes, no yes. stress tensor, but, uh, but it will have an associative operator also so, all, all with a conversion to P coefficient. All the what identities that you need are true and then you can derive this. Uh, yeah, the, well, you don't have the word identity because you don't have the stress tensor, but you will have the associativity of the OPE and unitarity. So what do you expect to be able to learn from the supergravity here, if there's any? Or the gravity, sorry, there's no super. So here I'm, I'm not talking about yeah. gravity. So there is no gravity. There is no gravity. Of course, yeah. even in this case. There is no stress energy sensor. Yeah. Yeah. They discussed putting super in mills, and then you could do like a double holography doing the dual of this theory, finding an ADS5 whose boundary is ADS4. Okay, but that's, that's a different story. Yeah. So at the far end of the spectrum, that should, this should sort of match to the yeah. S matrix bootstrap. Of the glue block, the glue, glue wall, right? Yeah. Right. Here, so this is flat space S matrix bootstrap of the glue balls. Yeah, I mean this is a generic statement that if you take conformal bootstrap with operators uh, and you take the operators involved the dimensions becoming very large, you go to the S matrix bootstrap. Right. But sort of what seems interesting about the setup is that. It, at the weak coupling end, the things that you were computing were not, from the flat space point of view, single particle states. Right, right. So there was no obvious bootstrappy kind of thing you could do 
for, I mean, uh, yeah, the, the S matrix would only apply here. Here, right. Yeah. It's an interpolation from flat space bootstrap mm -hmm. to something involving multi-particle states. Well, it's, it's a, well, why, why do you say it's a well, multi-particle well, state? Well, single trace. It's a single so. trace operator. So it's it's single trace, but uh, if we think of it from the point of view of flat space, those were two gluons. They were not bound together. But, but in flat space, we never do the S matrix bootstrap of gluons, right? We, we all, always do the S matrix bootstrap like at some bound state of glue. glue yeah, yeah, but, but, but these are the degrees of freedom of the theory. Yeah, in, in, well, in what, what, you, why, why, why couldn't you do it of, for gluons? Because it's confining. No, no, in, at weak coupling, this would not be. I mean, right. So suppose we just, just took n equals 4 super young minus, for instance. Then we could do it for gluons, right? Yeah. Yeah, that, that I agree. That I agree. Like, so, right. Of course, I agree. When you go to flat space, it would confine because there's no scale to keep it weakly coupled here. But it just, the physics there is not of a small bound particle in the weak coupling end, right? It's, it's really of two guys moving around in ADS. Yep. Whereas at that end, it's of one guy. So it's an interpolation. Sounds very interesting. But I mean, a conformal would so you calculate the first order in perturbation theory, and then you would check whether the naive analytic continuation would continue to solve the bootstrap, or what could you use the bootstrap for? No, Even the fact that you don't have your bounds and so on, right? Yeah, that's a difficult question. But but we do have some methods, but they they mostly work so far in two dimensions, so in, in, in 1D conformal theory, where we can follow continuous solutions of the conformal bootstrap. We can, if given one solution, one extremal solution of this conformal then you have bootstrap, you change a parameter, and you, I mean, you see, for the conformal bootstrap point of view, you wouldn't draw this plot. You would draw the plot like this. You would, you would say, as a function of delta 1, let's plot all the others. Let's plot this delta 1. This, this curve is delta 1, this curve is right. You would plot all the others, and so, well, delta... This one would be just straight, and this one would go and then have a different slope, and what you care is about the relative slope. The relative slope between these curves when it goes to infinity. So you, you could try to continuously... But, but, mean that but you it's, have... it's difficult. It's not known how, it's known how to do in two dimensions. If you assume that each line doesn't split, so there is, there is no degeneracy. But here, it's going to be harder because from here, there will be many lines that will split, right? Because the, the, the free spectrum is very degenerate. There's lots of states where you can have the same integer summing many gluons or derivatives. So the bootstrap typically gives you bounds, right? So wouldn't you just know that delta 2 has to be bigger than or smaller than something? And how can you then track it unless you have some, unless it sits at a kink or whatever, you can? Yeah, no, that's true. Uh, that's true. We would have to search for um, for some observable that is extremized by this solution, and then we would keep that. Yeah. Then you are hoping that your theory is sort of the, in some it's sense, the extreme, the analog of three D Ising or whatever. It's an ex yeah, but I mean, all O N models are extreme of something, right? You, we can see. So, so it's. And, uh, and the, 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 super, the super conformal bootstrap also was able to find the known theories at the boundary, so I mean, of course, it's not guaranteed. Is an electric boundary condition more suitable for numerical bootstrap? Because there are, we expect some phase transition there. Right, so if you take electric, um, then uh, you don't project to singlets, and in particular, you have the current itself dual to the single gluon state. <coughs> and so as you turn on the coupling, because this is a protected operator, a conserved current, it cannot get a normal dimension. So there it's a bit unclear what will happen, but it, does, it seems you cannot really go continuously. Right, but so, so somehow like a, the bootstrap solution which existed in the weak like a small ADS radius, yeah. should, this should somehow disappear if you go the large ADS radius. Right. So that maybe one can address it using numerical bootstrap, hopefully. Yeah, but I mean, you wouldn't learn about blue holes. But... Yeah, well, that's true. But like, but, you uh, we can yeah. show the confinement confinement transition. The existence. Yeah, yeah, one scenario is that like the two-point function of the current 
goes to zero and changes sign, so it kind of becomes non-unity yeah, yeah, yeah. after some coupling or something like that. It's, but yeah, it's, uh, they discuss several scenarios. Yeah. It's an uh, interesting discussion. Okay, okay uh, thank you very much. Uh, and <laughs>